So who likes poetry? I do. I like poetry. I'm Dr. Newman. I'm a professor of English at Missouri State University. Um, why do I like poetry? Because poetry can do things that other kinds of writing can't. Um, a lot of people might wonder why poetry exists at all. Why write anything as a poet as a poem when you can literally write it any other way? And I'm going to make an argument for you here as to why one could or should write a poem, and also what we look for to try to understand in poems when we encounter them, when, when we're given the task or when we give ourselves the task of saying, what does this poem mean? Why do the specific difficulties that a poem presents to us and why? All right, so, so join me here. Let's get started. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll learn something. All right, let's go. Our focus here is going to be on the idea that poetry is an act of communication. It's not just a puzzle to solve. It's not like a crossword where you you know you figure out the meaning, you, you you crack the egg, and then boom, you're done. But it's something that somebody's needed to say to somebody else, and they thought poetry was the best way they could say it. And so they made this thing. So let's give it the attention it deserves. You know what I'm saying? Um, all right. When you're reading poetry, there's three kinds of que there's three questions you can ask. I feel um, that are the, the fundamental questions that you're asking, no matter what poem it is, whether it's by Shakespeare or by a modern poet or whatever. First, the topic: What is this poem about? What are they talking about? Two, the theme: What does the poem have to say about the topic? And those aren't the same thing, right? My my theme could be about oatmeal. This is a poem about oatmeal, but okay, I hate it, oatmeal, oatmeal is nutritious, whatever it is. A theme, a topic is just a word, it's just a label, but a theme is is a sentence. There's something you're saying about something else. There's like a, a, a verb in there, like oatmeal is good, oatmeal is bad, poetry sucks, I like poetry, I don't, I don't like poetry. Um, and finally, how does it work? How does the poem express its theme or message? And this is a question about form. And these are the three fundamental things that we do when we read a poem. We say, what is it about? What does it have? To, what is it saying about what it's about? And how does it say it? Let's move on. Um, going back to the question I started with, why say something as a poem rather than literally any other way? Going back to the answer I started with, it's because poetry can do things other modes of writing can't. And one of the things that poetry does is to really work heavily with what we call figurative language. Figurative language is language that breaks the rules of how language is supposed to work. It's language that can't literally be true or it won't make sense. So let's have a look at a poem to give you an example of some, and, for, and I'm going to let you try to find something, some of these, okay? Let's have a look. This poem is about by an American woman named Sharon Olds. Um, it's written in around 1981, uh, and it's called The One Girl at the Boys' Party. So I'm going to read this poem to you, and while you're listening to, you, listening to it, I want you to ask a few questions. Who's talking and what are they saying? and how are they saying it, why are they saying it, but the first thing I'm going to ask you to look for are things that don't make sense, that aren't our regular way of talking, that don't literally mean something in a very specific way that refers to a kind of concrete reality. In other words, I'm asking you to look for figurative language. When I take my girl to the swimming party, I set her down among the boys. They tower and bristle. She stands there smooth and sleek, her math scores unfolding in the air around her. They will strip to their suits, her body hard and indivisible as a prime number. They'll plunge into the deep end. She'll subtract her height from ten feet, divide it into hundreds of gallons of water, the numbers bouncing in her mind like molecules of chlorine in the bright blue pool. When they climb out, her ponytail will hang its pencil lead down her back, her narrow silk suit with hamburgers and french fries printed on it will glisten in the brilliant air and they will see her sweet face, solemn and sealed, a factor of one, and she will see their eyes, two each, their legs, two each, 
and the curves of their sexes, one each, and in her head she'll be doing her wild multiplying as the drops sparkle and fall to the power of a thousand from her body. Now why don't you pause the video here and take a look at this poem uh, and look for figurative language. Look for sentences that, taken in themselves out of context, don't make sense, that violate common logic. These include things like metaphors and similes and other types of personifications, if you find that. Other, you know, other of those English class things that, that, that you know what I mean. So go ahead and pause it now and take some time with your class to look for those. And we're back. Did you find some literary devices, some figurative language? Did you? I'll show you some of that I found and we can compare. Um, first thing that I found was um, her math scores unfolding in the air around her. Now, again, when I say look, when I ask you to look for figurative language, I ask you to look for a language that literally can't be true. It has to have some meaning that isn't that requires interpretation because you can't literally unless people are throwing like pieces of paper while she's walking by the pool it, that's not literally happening so it asks us to do some work to supply the meaning or to try to figure out what the meaning is um but what i want you to do as as readers of poetry is to hold off on um solving these pro these these figurative languages as puzzles one by one but think about the pattern that they present together so let's look at the next one uh, that i that i found they will strip out their suits her body hard and indivisible as a prime number now there we have i don't know what what we call this her math scores unfolding in the air around her imagery i'm not really sure i, I kind of cat well, i'm not going to use fancy language but it's it's breaking uh it's it's not realistic right this is a, a good old-fashioned simile we have an as it's it her body is indivisible as a prime number now i don't know if you in your other classes if you've gotten to prime numbers yet but it's like one three seventeen 23 numbers that can't be divided by anything but themselves in one it's not unlike a nine which you can split into three threes or a 15 which you can split into threes and fives a prime number you can't divide so her body is indivisible okay all of our bodies are indivisible that's interesting right i mean we can't like you can't slice me in half like an earthworm and you know, like, my legs will go that way, and, and I'll drag my, like, you know, in a horror movie, I'll drag myself by my arms the other way. We are all, in, in a sense, indivisible. Um, and what does it mean to be indivisible as a prime number, though? Like, why why make that comparison? Let's move on. Um, the numbers bouncing in her mind like molecules of chlorine in the bright blue pool. We have another simile. We're just working with the basics here, right? Simile is just the bread and butter of poetry. What does it mean? The numbers bouncing in her mind. Again, this is a figure of speech. The idea of numbers bouncing in her mind, we're, common, we're combining something that's kind of abstract, that's just an idea with an image that is material, perceptible, that of bouncing so we're kind of like putting together bodies with um thought here and i think we're starting to see a pattern of meaning develop out of not just one instance of figurative language but a, an accumulating pattern the numbers bouncing in her mind like molecules of chlorine in the bright blue pool one thing i love that olds is doing here is that she's kind of bringing together the the realm of ideas of mathematics of numbers with the realm of bodies and the physical and the material by thinking about chlorine molecules in the pool so we've we've kind of shifted in the whole stem you know science technology engineering and math we've just made a little lateral move here from mathematics to chemistry that takes us at just out of the realm of pure ideas and thought and into the realm of body the body the realm of the body where 
um, of the, the pool where her body is going to splash into. And we make another, we make a move in, from mathematics in a different direction, um, away from the idea of mathematics as a set of ideas or concepts and towards something that a person does with their body sitting at a desk, right, with a pencil and a paper. Um, her ponytail is now hanging like a pencil lead, and just straight and black, like you put inside of a mechanical pencil. Um, so th we're developing a set of ideas about bodies, about minds, about mathematics, about chemistry, um, in a number of different ways that th these images are being used to frame this experience. And we're going to talk more about that experience in a second. Um, let's, let's skip down to the end, to the final um, uh, figurative language that ends this poem. In her head, she'll be doing her wild multiplying. As the drops sparkle and fall to the power of a thousand from her body. Now, we get that that con that union of head and body that I would that I was talking about. How this develops in her head, she'll be doing wild multiplying, which, um, on the one hand, has a mathematical register, but on the other hand, we're talking. She's talking. We're talking about a girl who's checking boys out and um, what's going on in her head. So maybe there's other meanings of multiplying that are happening that the poet is playing with. Um, and this idea of multiplication, of increasing, of growing, all of that is then sort of increased with the idea of to the power of a thousand, right? With the power being both the power of her growing human body, maybe the, the, the mother seeing the glimpse of a future sexuality that emerges, and also um, power as mathematics again, the idea of power as, you know, uh, f three to the power of five is three times three times three times three times three, right? So there is a kind of pattern of figurative language that is developed through this poem. Her math score is unfolding, indivisible as a prime number, bouncing in white cup molecules, pencil lead, wild multiplying powers. There's other instances that you can find in this poem too of the poet developing um, a pattern of diction, diction being word choice, that goes along with a set of similes and metaphors and imagery that uh, create a problem for us, that create the kind of challenge that this poem presents to us as a poem, right? It isn't just like, I took my girl to a, to a pool party she was walking around and there were boys and I was thinking about her and how she's good at math. And I, then I was thinking about how, you know, you know, she'll, maybe soon she'll be interested in boys and boys will be interested in her. Um, so I've just created a situation or I've just inferred a situation. I've kind of taken clues to um, think up a situation for this poem, but others are possible. One of the things that that I want you to do when you read a poem is not just look at the problems and sort of solve them one by one, but think about how they work together to develop a voice, a, a speaker, a person who's trying to say something, an act of communication. Um, this is just another picture of Sharon Olds uh, here. So a few questions here. One, who is talking in the one girl at the boys pa party? Take a break, maybe, and discuss that, and then we'll come back. Is it a parent? Is it a mother? I assumed it was a mother, but I had students in one college class saying that it was the father. And when they read it as a father, they, they thought very different things, because then they introduced there was this element of worry in thinking about this girl with all these boys, right? But again, this is um, one thing that I want you to do when you're thinking about who is talking is to work just from what is in the poem. There's no more reason to assume that it's a mother than there is that it's a father. The speaker never identifies themselves. But so we want to make an interpretation that works from the text. Um, it seems to be the parent's child. It seems to be the child's parent, right? Um, so what else can we say? Um, who do, why does it matter who's talking? If it's a friend, if it's a parent, it's a grandparent, then the kind of attitudes, the emotional color that we attach to the mathematical imagery changes. If it's a mother, 
um, how, how does that change from whether it's a father in, t in terms of talking about her hamburger and French fry bathing suit? Um, who is the speaker talking to? And I, I have some cheesy clip art here to illustrate this question. Who is the poem talking to? And you're like, okay, well, weird question. The reader, obviously. But who who is the imagined reader? And who are, are there is in every case is the poem talking directly you, reader? I'm going to tell you about this time I took my daughter to the pool. No, I don't think so. I think that they have a different audience in mind, and I think it can be and it can vary. So I want you to take a few take a few minutes here if you want, and talk to each other about who is the speaker talking to? Who's intended to hear what this poem has to say? All right, I'll wait here. Go ahead and hit pause. And I'm back. Okay, who did you find that they were talking to? Um, I have my ideas here, which I will share with you now. We'll see if, if we came up with any similar ideas. Another parent? Is there somebody else at the pool? I don't know. There's, I don't see any evidence in the text for that, but I mean, it, it seems possible. Are they talking to another mother? Are they talking to their own mother? Um, again, I would caution you not to make your interpretations depend on inventing a situation, but work from what's there. These are possible, and if you're writing about the poem, you could say one possible interpretation, but don't claim anything like she's talking to her ex-boyfriend or something like that that you can't support with evidence from the poem. Um, is she talking to the child in the future? Or is she talking to herself, assuming that this is a mother talking, right? I often, I think, in poetry, especially in short poems that are reflective like this, uh, they're deliberative. This is a fancy word for, that is to say that they're thinking out loud. They're exploring a problem. It's not like they have a settled position that they're going to argue with you but more like they're trying to figure out what they think about something. And poetry is really good for this because the figurative language offers a way to articulate one's own ambiguities, one's ambivalences. That is, um, again, fancy words for saying when somebody feels two ways about the same thing at the same time. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt conflicted about somebody? I like them, but I don't like them. I want to do this, but I don't want to do this. I like this aspect of myself, but also it annoys me. Um, this is, I think, a part of human experience. And it's a part of human experience that uh, um, uh, poetry is really good at expressing because of the fact that figurative language can be interpreted in multiple ways. So what is the mother talking about and why? Who is she talking? And I think this is connected to who is she, who she's talking to. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm proceeding from the argument that it's a mother here and, and we're and identifying it roughly with Sharon Olds herself, who was a mother and writes about motherhood. Um, let's look at uh, this poem. Is she writing about, she's talking about her daughter. Okay. So what is she talking about her daughter as? She's talking about her daughter as a student, right? Maybe she's proud of her kid for being good at math. She's also talking about her kid as a human being who's growing and has a body and a body that's going to go through changes. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too de detailed about that. This is not health class. Um, as someone who, though, at coming with those changes, may experience both desire for others and being desired by others. And so we have this situation where we have a parent watching their child, be watching others and being watched by them and thinking about this and feeling all kinds of ways about this, as, as, the, as the kids say. Like, is she, she, she may be scared, perhaps, and out of this fear, she wants to... Um, just focus on the stuff that is easy for her to think about, like the fact that her kid's good at math. And so maybe this isn't just about her daughter. Maybe it's about herself, too, and her own reactions to things. Um, is she's talking about her pride that maybe she has in her daughter's math skills and in her confidence, just diving into that pool? Maybe she's feeling ambivalent. That is, she feels two ways at once about her daughter growing up. We want to see our kids grow. We want to see them thrive and be healthy and, and, and come to enjoy all the things that adult life includes. But perhaps there is a refusal or at least a reluctance to acknowledge the possibility of her daughter's 
developing sexuality. Um, and we can trait and we can connect this if we want to the French fry bathing suit, which speaks both to like childlike appetites for food and childlike innocence, but also um, the fact that she's wearing a bathing suit at a boy's party. So it creates this whole tense, ambivalent situation that speaks to multiple dimensions of being a parent at the same time. And this is, I think, one of the things that poetry does really, really well. It, cre it recreates the experience of living in a way, of living through language, of living in a way where we feel multiple things at the same time. And now I've said that multiple times, but that's my main point here. And, it, and it's really coming back to what I'm saying at the beginning of this video, which is why write something as a poem when you can write it in literally any way, other way. I hope I've given you one answer to this question. What I'm gonna lead you off, what I'm gonna leave you off with is two things. I'm gonna leave you with um, uh, a checklist that combines some of the different things we've talked about already. Some of the fundamental questions to ask when you're reading a poetry is, what is this about? What is its take on the topic? And how does it say what it has to say? What are the, and this is one where you can really lean into, you know, similes, metaphors, imagery, um, sound patterns, like alliteration, all that English class stuff. But I also want you to think about not just uh, cutting it up into these little sort of techniques that you find, but the overall pick, um, act of speech that the poem represents, the overall message of it, by always keeping these questions in mind. Who is the speaker? Sometimes it's the poet, sometimes it's not. Sometimes they make up a character that they're speaking in, like, like in a, pop songs do this too. Um, uh, who is the speaker? Who are they talking to? And what are they talking about? Right? And, and how do these things connect to each other? So those are, those are some questions I want you to keep in mind. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share one other poem by Sharon Olds with you. And it's a poem called Armor. And if um, the one girl, boy, girl at the boys party is a poem about being parent to a girl, I think this poem is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little, I'm going to throw you a lifeline here. And I'm going to say, I think this poem is about being a parent to a boy. Let's have a look at it. Just about at the triple-barreled pistol, I can't go on. I sink down as if shot beside the ball of its butt, larded with mother of pearl. My son leaves me on the bench and goes on. Hand on hip, he gazes at a suit of armor, blue eyes running over the silver, looking for a slit. He shakes his head, Hair greenish as the gold velvet cod skirt hanging before him in volutes. I have no idea what that is, by the way. I'm going to look it up in a dictionary later, though. Uh, the cod skirt hanging before him in volutes at the metal groin. There's the metal groin. Next, I see him facing a case of shields, fingering the sweater over his heart. And then for a long time, I don't see him, as a mother will lose her son in war. I sit and think about men. Finally, Gabriel comes back, sated, so fattened with gore his eyelids bulge. We exit under the huge tumescent jousting irons, their pennants of faded rose, like the mist before his eyes. He slips his hand lightly in mine and says, not one of those suits is really safe. But when we get to the wide museum steps, railed with gold, like the descent from heaven, he can't resist, and before my eyes, down the stairs, over and over, clutching his delicate, unprotected chest, Gabriel dies and dies. Oof, okay. Pause, and look for figurative language, metaphors, simile, imagery. See if you can find a pattern, a, like words that seem to go together, that seem to, to cross all across the lines to create threads of meaning through the poem beyond just saying, I took my kid to the museum, he saw some suits of armor, I had some deep thoughts. Um, yeah, pause. 
And we're back, and once again, let's play the game of figuring out what we have identified. Well, there's the imagery of weapons. There's the pistol, there's the armor, and there's shields. Um, so that's definitely one thing that's going on. This is a poem that's in some sense about violence, and about, and it's also about men. My son, uh, he, I think about men. A mother will lose her son in, in war. Um, and this this is sort of one pattern of meaning that's developing as well. There's also, I think, a sense of the vulnerability of the body. His eyes, he's looking for a slit in the armor, right? The groin is an area of vulnerability. He's fingering the sweater over his heart. What a wonderful contrast between the metal breastplate and the sweater over his heart, um, drawing our attention to the vulnerability of his body. And then we get this idea that she says, I sit and think about men. And I love that she doesn't say anything about that. We, we're, she doesn't say, this is what I think about them. I think they're violent or bloodthirsty or they're foolish or they're a bunch of babies or, or that they're, you know, they, they you know, don't put the toilet seat down. They, she doesn't say any of that. She leaves the gap for us to fill. And she connects it with what comes back next. Finally, Gabriel comes back sated. Now there's a big word. There's a poetic word. Sated, if you look it up, means to be filled completely, like after you've eaten a big meal. He's sated by looking at all these weapons and armor at the museum, so fattened with gore, his eyelids bulge. And then we exit under the huge tumescent jousting iron. So I'm going to let your teachers uh, talk about um, what this might, how this might connect to, to masculinity. Um, but their penance a faded rose like the mist before his eyes. And then we have this touching moment of vulnerability, of boyhood, where she's been worried about losing him, about what kind of person he says. And he, and he says, not one of those suits is really safe. I love this direct speech here. But then he dies and dies. What's going on at the end there? Obviously, it's not literal. I mean, I don't think this is a poem about the death of a child. This is a poem, perhaps he is, to answer some of the questions. You know, who's talking? The mother. Who's she talking to? Somebody who's also interested in questions about parenthood and perhaps gender. Who is she? Um, what is she talking about and what's her take on it? She's talking about the attachment of boys to the imagery of war and to the tools of war. And she's also talking about her own, once again, ambivalence about that. Is Gabriel here at the end dying of um, uh, is it pretend? Is he playing pretendsy here? Is he imagining, or is there something else going on there? I don't really know. I haven't spent that much time with this poem, but it seems to be one that really invites us to lean in and think about the kind of experience that she's trying to communicate and her own ambivalences about her, her that experience. And also here, I think that she is, maybe, I could be wrong. There's no one correct interpretation to a poem, um, despite what you may have heard. There's always multiple possible meanings and there's multiple wrong meanings, but there's multiple right meanings too. Maybe she's communicating his own ambivalence about um, death and dying and the vulnerability of the body and what sort of traditional models of warrior masculinity call upon a boy to be able to, the dangers which they're calling a boy to be able to submit their body to, right? And the, the, the attitudes that we're expected to have about that. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe she is projecting those into him. I don't know. All I know is that I'm trying to base these readings just on what I find in the poem and not on sort of imagining other scenarios or other scenes or other situations. This is what poetry calls us to do is just to focus with to call us to focus with precision on these very specific um, moments in time. I hope that this has been helpful and or, and or illuminating to you. I hope you read more poems. There's lots of poems online. Um, I can go to, uh, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Uh, but, um, I think that it's worth your time and I hope, um, that you continue to have fun reading poetry in your English class. Thank you. Have a great day.